Hey, it is 11 o'clock now, so I'd like to say uh, welcome. We just got our last panellist in at the last minute there. So I'd just like to say welcome to everybody to what is now the 13th ILC Home Claims webinar. We're focused on building claims. First of all, a big thanks, as always, to uh, our corporate partners, um, to Carpenters, CoreLogic, GeoBear, iCab, Coravent, the Innovation Group and Veris, really pleased to, for all the help that you've given us put on these webinars. Thank you very, very much. Uh, but most of all, a huge thanks to all of you who, I don't know whether it's tuning in, listening in or watching every week for webinars, but, but whatever it is you do, uh, we get a lot of feedback, both if you've watched live or if you've watched our recordings, which we email out or are on the ILC website. Um, at the end of the day, really, we, we're only here to, to help you. Uh, today you'll hear things and we hope you share them, we, we learn from them, uh, we, we listen to each other, consider the thoughts that are put forward. Home claims is about the people who listen to this and they can have the biggest impact in very uncertain times. So a uh, quick plug for a few of our events. Uh, as you both, as you all know, the building conference has been put off a couple of times, but will now take place at Coventry on the 29th of September. Um, we'll soon be giving you details in our home conference, traditional one, which will take case, uh, place the 11th of November. If you're interested in sponsorship for that, you can contract, contact Nick at I Love Clean, Tom or myself, and I'll put you in contact with Nick. Vic, our virtual motor conference next month is an exciting way of... of uh, dealing with the current pandemic and getting out to uh, most of the base on our motor side. And also every Wednesday, we, uh, my colleague Mark introduces the Mark 360 webinar, which is also well listened to as well. Back to us and today, I guess, <clears throat> uh, we, we've concentrated in the last few weeks in building claims restarting. We've looked at it practically, financially, priorities, dangers, vulnerabilities. Um, and we're going to continue that today, but today's I think straddles, uh, if you straddle three things, it straddles pre, during and post pandemic because we're going to talk about scheduled rates, which is always a, a focus of great discussion. So today we're going to look at how adaptive and fluid are the situation where we've got changes in working practice all the time, where we've got uh, materials going in and out of stock and changing price. Uh, and just a lot of unsure things going on. We're also going to take a look forward about how that will occur over the next few months or as long as it takes to get back to any form of normal. But then with uh, the people we've got, we can also take a really good look at the uh, forward and how pricing and schedule of rates might evolve in the future. So uh, we'll explore all of that with our guests and I'm really delighted to have with us Will Cobell of LNG. Will's the head of major loss and supply and management. Uh, we've Liam is MD of the Foreshore Group. Uh, delighted to have my old colleague Peter Wassell, a uh, technical director of Sedgwick Repair Solutions, a man who knows more about schedule of rates, I think, than anybody else I've ever met, and a very balanced too. Delighted to welcome Paul, <coughs> Paul Anderson, a uh, Ops Director of okay, Paul is the person I've put on who can understand language this week. Sometimes there's one, sometimes there's two. Uh, and of course, welcome back uh, to regular contributor Mike Porter is the Senior Leader of International Matters, Matters at CoreLogic. Welcome to you all. All the views are their own and that's what it's about. It's about sharing views and thoughts. At the bottom, as always, you'll see questions and, and chats. Please put them in. We'll be monitoring them as we go through. Um, so I guess any questions you've got, anything you think you can contribute to this or to future webinars, please just uh, drop me a note at alan at iloveclaims.com. Um, so let's get started. I'll come to you, Liam, first as, as the contractor in this. Um, in a couple of minutes, can you tell me how, how are schedule of rates holding up in the current environment? Um, I think uh, now they're starting to look a bit more promising. I think early on, obviously coming from that uh, kind of initial lockdown, uh, a lot of fear, a lot of worry around um, how we're going to operate as a business and to continue to operate as a business. Um, I think insurers and loss adjusters got on board with that quite early in terms of viewing uh, some of the impact of that uh, from an operational perspective. Um, I think there's a, a bit of a spectrum across um, all the brands and, and all the uh, the clients on where they're kind of addressing 
uh, the needs of the schedule and to, to deal with the with the COVID. Uh, I think some are more ahead than others. Um, some have put on some real quality uh, conferences to discuss the issues openly, look at what the issues are, and then uh, together do that collaborative approach, just try and address them. Um, so some increased um, rates, um, some uplifts on uh, scheduled items to try and just, just take care of that uh, additional administration and, and operational needs. I think there's a, a, a there's still a lot more to be done. There's still a lot of catch up with some companies. I think that will only become apparent as the, the workflow starts to increase. And um, you know, there's there's lots of things to consider here, Alan, with the our own uh, work environment. So getting people back into our workplaces, um, going into people's homes, how we manage that environment, and then the materials, which is a whole uh, ball game on its own. Uh, and combined, that that brings these. Uh, kind of operational costs that we, that we have to deal with. And I think those that aren't addressing it at the moment, uh, very quickly we will have to, or um, or they, they just won't, they won't be serviced because it'll be uh, unattainable. Okay. Um, Paul, from your perspective, and wider perspective of disaster recovery and repair, how, how do you see the current schedule of rates being fluid or flexible enough to cope with the, the changing landscape? I certainly think that, you know, as we've kind of moved forward into this kind of new way of working, um, the scheduler rates are, have been very fluid, but what we've been able to do is take on a job-by-job -job basis with most of our key clients. So instead of looking at the schedule as on its own, we've been able to look at each individual job and then discuss, you know, what the cost impact are of, of purchasing certain materials. So that has been one good um, one thing that we've been able to really drive. In terms of um, our relationship management at Belfort, they've really kind of taken that to our customer base and, and discussed, you know, the issues around material purchase, PPE purchase, which is also a big, a big topic at the moment. But, you know, the insurers and, you know, our key clients have been very, very open to, you know, incurring some of those additional costs that we're feeling in, in the back of. Um, the other thing that we're kind of seeing is a lot of downtime. So it's looking at, you know, when you go into certain builders, merchants, picking materials, picking up materials, there's a lot of kind of time added because there's, there's not just us going in there, there's a lot of other contractors that's kind of are doing this, exactly the same thing. So the impact of the material purchase is one thing, but the downtime is also another thing, Alan. Okay, okay, see that's quite significant. Yeah. And of course, the case-by-case -case basis could be time-consuming for all Ryan. Well, from, from your angle, um, sitting with the pressures of an insurer and price and cost and an uncertain time around you and, and having to maintain a supply chain under a lot of other pressures, how are the schedule of rates working for you at LNG and other insurers that you know of? Uh, well, just mind for a fact that three of my suppliers are actually on the call. <laughs> and, um, <laughs> uh, yeah, I think uh, at the moment it's, it's a real unknown um, in terms of from, from a from a financial perspective and, and how financially solid schedules of rates across the in, in industry are, I think it's too early for us all to assess on whether they're suitable or not. Um, some, some insurers, some networks have taken action. We're one of them. Um, okay. other, others haven't. Um, and, and so there's, there's a variety of different, different approaches that the that, that insurers are taking across the UK market at the moment. Um, so it's difficult for me to answer on, on whether they're working. I think from, Certainly, from from the expertise and the technical knowledge that we have we have in house, we, we we've gone our own way and uh, and decided to to make some some changes, which hopefully will will allow um, our supply chain to um, get back out, out on site as, as the as the lockdown eases and, and customers allow us to. Um, but I I just think at, at the moment, particularly with materials, there's so many unknowns. Um, there, there, I think there's local pocket there's pockets locally where materials are quite sparse at the moment, but I expect that will recover. Um, over over the coming weeks, I think I think where I would be concerned for for my supply chain and, and my customer um, is where where insurers competitors haven't made any changes and and that's that's most most in the market um, and the pressure that puts on our suppliers because our suppliers work for all of our competitors and I think where margins are being squeezed at a time where where our supply chain have just gone through a whole quarter um, of a year um, with effectively no income. Uh, I, I think that's going to press upon them. Um, so I, th I think that the market should do something. Um, they should recognise that uh, the undertaking work in people's homes 
is now a completely different ball game to what it was before. Um, and I know that myself. I've had an escape of water during lockdown. And I've actually um, got, got the builders at my house at the moment. And a two-day job is now a six-day job purely because of COVID. So there in itself, I've, I've experienced what it looks like and how think things look different to our supply chain. So I think, I think insurers need to, whatever decisions they want to make, they need to make them quickly um, for the benefit of the supply chain. Yeah, interesting. You, got, you, you can see that firsthand, Will. Um, um, Cedric's Repair Solutions, you can sit in the middle somewhere where you've got to make sure that the suppliers have sufficient uh, money to carry out the repair, but equally demonstrate to your clients that you're exercising due control and cost scope and everything. So look at the current schedule of rates as a practically adapted wide. I know, I know the uh, prices can be slightly different, but the general adaption wide within the industry. How is that coping with the current changing environment from your angle? Sorry, I mean, is that for me? Yes, it was Peter. Sorry for hear that. Yeah. Sorry, pardon. Yeah, um, I think at the moment all all schedules of rates systems can cope because systems have been built to deal with new things. I think the issue you probably mean is how are the actual rate items themselves able to adapt? So, can we build schedules that accurately describe what we've now got to do? And I think that's very, very difficult because nobody ever envisaged the level of PPE that you might have to use, the degree of cleaning, the degree of forward planning that you'd have to do. So schedules of rates, I don't think at the moment, can cope in terms of describing that work, but they can all cope by refunding the contractor for the efforts that he's had to make. We've just got to find new ways of doing that. And I think what Will said is the really important point is everybody doing something now. So much as, as LNG have done, we've taken action to ensure that contractors are getting uplifted rates, they're getting additional payments to cover the additional costs as we calculate them to be at the moment. But this is a very, very difficult situation because um, material prices are fluctuating hugely. I think the biggest issue, though, is the, is the unproductive time element. So where we'll describe that job that was originally going to be two days, it's now six. That's a, a colossal impact from the contractor. And identifying and capturing that is the real key to this. And my concern is that many contractors won't actually know themselves for another two or three months. Combining that with all of the other issues that are going on in the economy with construction could mean that some of them could be left in a very difficult situation. Okay, Peter, thanks. That's very important. And I, and I, and I think what's important there is do we, when somebody comes and say to a proper plate, well, do they know it's going to take them four days longer or is, is that going to just uncover? So I, I guess advanced authorization becomes a, a tougher and slower process for that. Mike, turning to you, uh, we've talked separately about schedules of rate internationally, etc. Technically, as, as Peter would say, but also practically in terms of the rates and how you adapt them to the current situation. Are we in as good a position in the UK as some of the other countries that you operate in are, or have we got things to learn? I think there's a lot of, without let you know, without focusing on technology too much, even though it is my, obviously my background, I think the capability, as Peter says, for systems to adapt is all there. Um, so you can affect productivity rates very quickly on individual line items. You could affect um, materials allowances. You can allow for additional equipment on individual line items. It's all possible, like immediately. The challenge comes around and we provide, you know, a lot of our customers have come to us and said where they use, you know, our managed rates or, or even in the, if they use their own databases, they, they've added bespoke line items perhaps where they've enabled instead of affecting baseline pricing at this stage, what they're trying to do is actually identify the COVID related costs as separate costs within schedules so that they can identify it and allow for it separately. 
doesn't really work when it comes to purchasing materials and that's a separate challenge but it is you know that's how people have tried to approach it in the short term from a from a the, the, in the way that the rates are deployed through our platform i think um so the, the, the challenge is we don't know the answers. We don't know, you, you know, is it possible to immediately quantify the impact on productivity on, say, plastering? You know, I'm sure it is for the guys on the ground and the guys doing the, doing the work. You can see it. You've got the experience of doing that now, or at least over the last few weeks. But, you know, turning that into a quantifiable productivity rate for an individual line item is a significant piece of analysis work that also has a very significant impact on the carrier costs and therefore they um they want to make sure that they do that right and accurately and it can be evidenced if they do it at all so i think we might see more specified items relating to the costs and the overages related to covid rather than amending baseline pricing for that's been in place for a period of time that's what might happen but it's all possible Unfortunately, it's probably more flexible than we, well, it's definitely more flexible than we currently take advantage of. Things like market conditions, pricing for materials has been available for a long time. You can be applied, you know, quite quickly, but um, we, we, we just don't know the answers yet. And that's why it's difficult to, to automatically make these kinds of changes quickly. Back, back to you then, Liam. What comes to mind <clears throat> and doing what I do in my consulting business is I hear a lot that a lot of complaint from suppliers that you know, it's tough we've got different changes of rates for different customers the mechanics of them can be quite lengthy so if we're going to have to do what the likes of uh, Peter and Mike said about not going out and finding ways to work right a realistic price is that making the schedule completion and pre-authorization process more complex for you? Um. I think it can be. I think, but we are learning. You know, as we've all alluded to, we're on a, a steep learning curve into um, you know this kind of new normal, new way of working, and this new environment is completely different to anything I've experienced. And you know, just to the fact that we're on this this kind of webinar now uh, speaks volumes of, of the way our world is changing uh, to deal with all these issues. Um, I think the rates are starting to flex a little bit. People are starting to understand. Um, where the costs are, certainly in that downtime for material collection, um, setting up environments. You know, it's a lot of, uh, a lot of time, uh, a lot of management of people that, that just isn't reflected in the rates at the moment. So I think it's good that people are starting to recognise that. As Peter said, it'll be a couple of months before the true picture that emerges, so we can start to make uh, more detail on that and start to have some kind of audit. You know, I think at the moment there could be a potential uh, for things to be abused, you know, if um, suppliers aren't following the right protocols and the right um, standard operating procedures, um, you know, if you do this thing properly, you know, as Will's experienced, the life cycles will extend. For us, that's a huge impact, especially now on our commercial and operational efficiencies. Um, you know, trying to wrap jobs up now is going to take a lot longer, which is going to uh, reduce our cash flow. We're going to be waiting longer for payment. You guys are going to be waiting longer to have your, your, your work signed off. But I think it's about getting together regular, reviewing what's working well, what isn't working well, and putting the appropriate rates in. You know, for us as builders, it's dead simple. You know, we, we want to know the labour, we want to know the material, and we want to know the plant, and we want to make sure that we, we've got uh, uh, the profits in there to, to cover our overheads, etc. cetera. Um, how that translates into the hundreds of schedules that, that, that we work with. Um, you know, but the bottom line for us, it's dead simple. You know, is, is enough money in there to do the job to the right quality and the right time uh, with the right people. Um, mm -hmm. But I think there's, there's a lot of sensible conversations going on, which I know through all the modelling, it has to come across in different ways. And it's up to each builder to, to flex within within them rates to, uh, to, to reach there. So, yeah, I think it is positive. And, and hopefully in, in the coming months, uh, between us all, we'll, we'll still be here to keep doing it. <laughs> and that's all for us all but you know it is a fair point there's a margin has to be made but equally uh, and I'll come back to Will in a few minutes but I'm going to go to Paul first equally we're in a we're servicing a cost a driven market where people buy by price and we're all buyers of that insurance product let's not forget so that makes it tough in insurance as well but Paul does this mean that you're really having to be in more contact and through every job 
with a with your clients because it is a changing picture. You want to make sure you don't get caught by going on and doing something extra for which you're not going to be reimbursed. Yeah. So that must be it must be increasing the traffic between the two of you. And, and I'm not sure that that's always over efficient to the end user in terms of the policyholder. Yeah, certainly we've certainly seen a, a, an increase in the administration of how we manage our day-to-day claims as such. Um, I think, you know, as it moves forward, I think in terms of the, the rates and what's going to happen with them, it's kind of open to all the all the key customers. You tend to see as if the rates of materials go up, they never come back down again. So this is this is will be the new way of kind of working as such. So the rates may have to be changed long term because you know, we're, we're tied into three or five year agreements. So there's, there's times that we, we have, we'll have to look at that. But the administration costs, you know, going back to that, it seems to be that we are having to put more manpower into administering those, those day-to-day issues we're getting with PPE and material purchase. So we are seeing an increase in that area. So it has to be addressed overall in the bigger picture in the mass claims market. Okay, thanks, Paul. Well, over to you. Well, you're one of a... Uh a very small band of people who have got a breadth of experience almost from all aspects uh, of this process, you know, having worked in, in the roles that you have worked in the past. So that, that does give you a kind of empathy all round. It does sound to me in all of this, well, we can do small increases. This is really going to be a very close uh, communication process between everybody. And as claims, as we return to work, and and its claims numbers are increased or repair numbers increase even if we're releasing old ones, is that going to be a challenge to maintain that level of communication that keeps you in control of of the costs, uh, keeps the contractors within margins and communicates well even if it's through a a, a middle network, loss adjuster, a claims management company, keeping all of these close sounds. Sounds quite challenging to me. Um, If I'm honest, if I speak to my staff, I think think they've actually found it easier. Uh, I, I think uh, time off the road, um, time in, in, in what can be at times pointless meetings, discussing not a lot, a lot because you've got a monthly review meeting with a supplier. Um, about, about my staff have reported that, or, or some have reported that it's actually the, the, the path of, and lines of communication have actually been a lot easier. I know that um, Brian Ness, uh, who, who runs our repair, neck at, our repair network at Elgil, um, has had some really, him and his team have had some really successful regional meetings with their um, with the regional building contractor partners um, and and they've gone really well um, and everybody's been really engaged everybody's in in, in the room as it were um, I, I just I just think at the moment we seem to be in a position where claim numbers across the market are now in the, in the last few weeks have started to tick up probably a little bit more quickly than most would have thought um, because we are effectively still in lockdown albeit with some some easing of restrictions and measures, we are still effectively um, not able to, to live our lives um, in and out of work as we, would, as we would normally ordinarily want to. And so the, the pace at which the industry is seeing claim volumes tick up, is, is, it's taken, taken, I think, the market by, by surprise. And, and that, that will probably continue. Um, if you look at where we were in the first few weeks of lockdown, it was like a ghost town everywhere you went. It just doesn't look like that anymore. So the more that people leave, leave their homes, the more that you're going to have fires, um, longer tail escape of water, um, more AD, more impact claims. Um, and so claim numbers will continue to tick up. Um, but but as, as that happens, I don't think that we'll get back to what, where we were before um, meeting with our um, with our partners, partners meeting with their clients. But I, I personally, I've, I've seen no barrier whatsoever from an, from an insurer's perspective. I've not seen any barrier to, to lines of communication. And actually, I would say, arguably, it's been better and will probably change once we come out of this for the better. That, that sounds really encouraging, actually. Um, Peter, over to you then. We've, we're talking about the change of rates and adaptability, and, and you quite rightly point out the difference between... Um, systems and actual schedules. So in looking at this, the structure and the purpose of rates, is our problem with scheduled rates at the moment having to change the values that we put on the individual items of work and the structure's fine? Uh, because it seems to me that we, we're able to say, right, we're in this, we can find ways around it structurally because we can put in certain lots here and there and do it. So is the structure fine and sound even to go forward? Or are there issues within the structure as well as the the cost values that we put in? 
Um, no, I think, I think the structures are okay, Alan, because rates are all about combining components, aren't they? Your labour, your material and plant. COVID doesn't alter any of that. The building task that you've got on site is still the same as it was before. You've still got those same elements. So I think the approach of rates is still sound. Our difficulty then is how those individual components vary. Obviously, the schedules of rates that are in place at the moment, they make assumptions about the, the price of the materials included within the rates. They make assumptions about the allowance for the labour to complete a task. When you've got a time like this where things are changing rapidly, that's where rates then can start to come under pressure. And I suppose what people like us who manage rates have got to look to do is to to make sure we've got mechanisms that are nimble, that don't in themselves cause further work and difficulty for the contractor, but reimburse them. And by that I mean, Alan, that people have spoken to me about um, wanting to know on small individual claims, what are the exact elements of cost increase? And they want to know that before they're happy to approve or pay a case. That's very, very difficult to do because at the moment, contractors may not be able to analyse on a £2,000 a scope of water claim what their unproductive time is or what the exact material cost element is. So I think what we can say is that the industry needs to be pragmatic. It needs to understand the difficulties of the contractors and say, perhaps on small cases, that it's acceptable to take an overall view and say that there may be an increase on the whole job cost rather than focusing on individual rates. I think the time to start looking in granular detail on the rates is, as we've said, in a couple of months' time, when everybody has a better understanding of how the regulations need to be worked out, the impact of cleaning, what happens when the, the cost of finishing plaster starts to settle down. But the actual structure of rates... I think it's still sound. Okay, thanks. Um, Mike, I'm going to take that on to you a little bit. Peter says the structure's sound, and that's, that's, that's fine. But one of the things I hear often is it's just the sheer extent of a schedule of rates, the number of items that people have to plough through to try and do something. I, I know there's a very short list of regular usage, but what would worry me now, I guess, and, and I'm not a builder, just in case anybody wonders, <laughs> What would worry me now is I'm having to use other things to try and get my way through the current situation. So do we have to have, do you think, the extent of the number of rates and line items that we have within a schedule? Uh, it's, a, it's a million dollar question. So we, if you compare what we have in terms of complexity in the UK and in insurance versus what we have in the US, it's magnitudes of, of difference in terms of complexity in the US you know, our, our database in the US that we we provide to our carriers through the platform is about 60,000 line items. And it includes, you know, dozens, if not hundreds of different material types um, based on manufacture all the way down to the level of detail that you just, it's just impractical. So, so that from, a, <clears throat> from an estimating perspective, so we've not really talked, we've talked about the schedules, but we've not talked about estimating. So the way that the estimating processes work, generally speaking, uses a date uses how uses the schedule rate structure however it, however it is structured in some cases the schedule of rates might just be a line item allowance for that effort um times a unit of measure it might go into a lot more detail sometimes they are broken down by labor material equipments with a productivity rate some of them times they're not sometimes it can be as simple as this is what i pay for an hour's worth of plastering you know it depends on the level of complexity liam made the point <clears throat> that there is uses hundreds of different schedule of rates and i'm sure that the way that those rates are applied in every case is different so i think um i'm not i'm speaking for you there liam so apologies if i'm wrong but i think the um, you know how estimating works is you know some some solutions automate the estimation of productivity based on units of measure some systems rely on the user to tell them what the productivity time is going to be. Some, some people don't use systems at all, and it's, a, it's based on the professional in the room. So I think um, 
how the estimating is done is going to have a big impact and what flexibility that allows. I think the, you know, it's an interesting, it's a difficult, we're, we're well placed to support the strategies that come out of this. I think we've got a system which um, will enable whatever flexibility people want to the point that we made a moment ago about are the rates appropriate? Is the structure appropriate? You can do it. There's many different ways to slice this up and there's many different ways to estimate. and There's many different ways to price a piece of work. We're, we're not the people who tell our customers how to do that. We're the people who help them choose to support the strategy that they adopt. Could it be simpler? Probably. Would that give, would that possibly undermine the contractors as well? It could do because, for example, if you did things like automated material feeds from retailers, um, which is all possible, you know, we could get automated email, uh, materials allowances from the builders merchants all over the UK and that pricing could change daily. The systems are available for that to happen. But what that does is it, it means that the allowances from materials are real and accurate at that time always and the allowance that you get for that will be the margins will be very carefully controlled on the materials. And once you introduce that type of thing, there's no going back. So it's kind of like, it's a double-edged sword because it, it means that margin becomes incredibly visible across a much broader um, population of claims, which to an extent means that the flexibilities that contractors have right now to work with different schedules is undermined. So there's a lot that is possible, whether it's desirable or not, um, and whether it solves the problems we're facing right now, um, I don't know. I think it's a, it's a take, take careful steps in those directions if you're going to make changes to the way that we traditionally apply schedules. Certainly structurally. Yeah. So let, let me go back to the two street repairers there. So we'll start, start with Liam and then go on to Paul. Liam, then, if we take this and then say that, you know, it's begin to look forward with the schedule, is the, it seems to me from listening to suppliers, there seems to be two issues um, with schedule rates. One is some of the basic uh, labour rates that are put into it, uh, even before the pandemic, would argue that they, they weren't really commercially competitive with other elements of the construction and building industry. I'm sure insurers and... and uh, <laughs> Others would say, well, there is a bit of a swing to mind about that. And the second thing is just to see a variance across the industry of the number of schedules of rates you have to uh, input into. So what would you like to see in the future that would help you as a supplier minimise the admin and maximise the saving to give the insurer the advantage? I think for, for um, suppliers and contractors and, and the builders, I think just the simplification of, of, of where the rates are at. You know, we spend hours and hours talking about rates for this, rates for that. We're invited in to do uh, rate reviews. <coughs> so we have our, um, you know, our kind of uh, standard rates. Then there's, you know, the rates that sit around the, the periphery of that for, um, you know, different situations. Um, you know, there's probably a list of about 50 that we would use on a regular basis for home repairs, which are great. Um, and that's how it's influenced by the, you know, the thousand other rates that they, they want to build in. Um, I think the auditing and the, the transparency of some of the schedules could be simplified. Um, you know, but that's only going to be done uh, by working with, with insurers and with partners to, uh, to get that, the right balance. I think sometimes, you know, for the smaller claims, you know, the £2,500 escape of water, I think some of the process can be overcomplicated. I think some of the auditing can be, um, you know, complicated as well. So it's just trying to sit down and simplify that. And then put the time in where we need it now. I think we're recovering from this uh, this lockdown. Um, I think there's a lot of nervousness, uh, certainly within this sector. You know, it's probably one of the hardest hit. Um, just sit down and, you know, just have some honest conversations about that recovery. Because I know there's a lot of subcontractors that we deal with won't be coming back. There are a lot of companies um, who are surviving at the minute because of the, the grants and, and the free money that the government has given. That will impact um, you know, who, who's going to be left at the end of it. Um, I think, but yeah, just looking at the operational efficiencies within, within the schedule, um, you know, just try and make it work. That, 
that's all we can do. And then to review it periodically, you know, as Peter said, three months, we'll have a better picture where we are uh, financially and what the real impact of, of that management is and how that impacts impacts the rates. Well, what about you, Paul? Because we... <clears throat> consistent throughout this there's, there's how do we find ways to make this work which might be a very good thing it might prove that you can find ways and it is flexible for different situations or is trying to find ways of making it work something that we should be looking to move out a little bit you're on mute Paul okay. firstly some of the, the, the things that we, we do on site so the t technicians, we talked about scheduler rates and different, you know, different systems that we all work with, but we expect the, the, the man in the field to know the system to use, what, the, what data they're collecting in order to build the schedule for that particular job. So the administration behind building, a, a, as Liam pointed out, a £2,500 claim can be very complex. So I think we can remove the complexities behind those smaller claims. We know what the average claim value is. We know what we, Insurers know what they want it to be. They want it to be lower than what it currently is. So there must be ways around of building a simplified model that stops the amount of administration on those smaller claims. I find that on the smaller water damage claims, there's more administration on them than there is on larger claims. Absolutely, all day long, we seem to put more data into the systems without actually looking at what we're doing in the larger claims, with little information put together um, in terms of that's all about the management of the claim. And I think if we can do that better, um, we will see a, uh, a reduction in cost. Some of the schedules that we have, we've got line items in those schedules that are never used, and, and we're asked to you know, look at a price for that item, a price for this item, but some of those items are never used, and I've not used, used them to this day. So I think there's, there's definitely ways of simplifying it um, and gathering less data and, and getting the job done quicker, is, is my answer. Thanks, Paul. Well, again, back to you, and again, this calls in the vast experience you have for such a young man, he said, sportingly. Um, two things, like somebody's already asked, is it time for a more uniform schedule of rates to, throughout the industry, similar to motor, but I accept there's differences there. Uh, and is there a way to be able to smooth out the process for the lower value claims that, that will still, and this is the important part, that will still allow insurers to meet their um, watch on value of claims, which, which is important because, as I keep reminding everybody, we, we, we look and ask insurers for more money, but home insurance is not a big ticket uh, financial product by any stretch. I mean, so, you know, two questions there one, simplify a lot of claims, and two, is there room for a more uniform process between insurers or in the market? I think it's hard. I think um, you're right about motor, but put simply, repairing a motor car is significantly more, more simplistic um, in the main than, than repairing a 19th century property, just, as, as, just to put one example out there. Um, it's repeat work, um, repeat parts, um, and repeat process um, in, in, in motor to, to a point. Um, it, uh, my belief is, is that it's, it's far more complex in, in, in the home space. So uh, could it happen? Yes. Will it happen? No. Um, it, it, not because it's such a hard piece of work to to undertake um, or such a difficult thing to do. Um, that should never really be the reason. Um, I just I just don't know how successful it could or would be, um, given the complexities of working in people's homes. That's not to say it's not the right thing to do. Um, I don't really have a view on that. I, 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 I'm just not sure how successful it, it could be. Um, and sorry, what the second question was related to low-value repairs? Yeah, low-value claims. I mean, we, we've heard a lot from the guys, and, and, and you've heard this a lot as well, that the, the, the process, I think to quote Paul, but, but generally the process for low-value claims can take as, as much time, if not more time, in detail than sometimes it does for higher-value claims. Mm -hmm. It obviously eats at low margins. Yeah, I think um, low value claims, it, it, my, what I think is low value um, might be different to what you or, or the next person. Yeah, well, I think, I think you were talking about two or three thousand pounds. Yeah. So, two or three thousand pounds take, take a lot of process and, you know, you have to understand what an insurer needs to be able to control to demonstrate to their board that claims spend, spend etc. So for, for, for those cases, and I'm not referring now to the likes of glazing, garage doors, um, drainage, uh, that, that, that's where you need your specialist supplier, your niche supplier in place. But for general reinstatement and building repairs, 
I, I would I would argue that what value is there to anyone in it going down that route um, most of the time? Um, so if you're talking about, a, say, a, a really small escape of water claim that's under £2,000, like my own home claim at the moment, um, it's, it's a lot of admin for the supplier, the supply chain. It's a lot of admin for the insurer. And does the customer want that fourth process put upon them? They probably don't know whether they want it, but actually with hindsight, probably for a lot of them, it doesn't work. So I, I, think, I think for those kind of claims, there's a real question for insurers to ask themselves, which is, does the customer want that? Is it serving any purpose for anybody, for the customer, for the insurer, or for the supply chain? Um, and I think in not all cases, but in some cases or a lot of cases, the answer is probably no. Um, there's a different way to deal with that. Um, obviously, 10, 15, 20 years ago, it was all supply chain, all builder. Um, I think I think the industry is moving, probably not at, at as quick a pace as it, as it could or should be doing. Um, but for those claims, those really small ones, ask yourselves the question if you're the insurer, what's the better option for the customer? Is it to put, the, put them through a process that's absolutely necessary on a larger claim where you need pro, a, an element of project management and different suppliers involved to get you back from pre-loss condition? Um, or is it to give you some options here? Give you the option of doing the work yourself, getting somebody to do it for you, giving you cash, not to force you, the customer down that route, um, but just to say, is that the better route? So I don't think, it, it, administratively, I don't, I don't think there's, there's any, any easy fix or way around it for those smaller claims. But I, certainly from the, from the building contractors that, that I speak to, um, and I think that's just been, been mentioned on the call here, they just find it inordinately um, difficult from an administration perspective. And they don't make it much, if any, margin on them. So actually what it does is it just saturates their ability to perform on the higher value claims. So my view is, is just insurers need to be a bit better at working out what's best for the customer. Okay. Really customer sensitive. Thanks. Well, Peter, over to you then. In, in looking at what we've got with changes of rates now going into the future, is our core problems more to do with actually the values that we put in, maybe for labour rates, etc.? Do you think that's more of a problem? Because we, we, we have this sort of thing where we've got to, certainly if you're in, in a position uh, that your businesses are, you, we have to be able to demonstrate to our insurance customers that we got a handle on, on cost. But, but as I said, we've also got to give sufficient cost for the supplier to, to make a margin. And, and if people work, have to work around that to make sure it works, is that because fundamentally we need to, one, be better at putting in, more realistic at putting in the values? And perhaps secondly, um, do, do we have to look at making it simpler to complete? Or is that going to strangle it more? I think we've got competing demands, something unfortunately, with the different stakeholders. Um, the systems that we have look to value work as accurately as we can, trying to make sure that everybody gets good value. I guess really the challenge, Alan, is that maybe we need to slightly readdress that because I think we need to bear in mind that when we're talking about the COVID problem at the moment, Construction is going to face a number of challenges in the next few months. There's Brexit that's going to have some kind of impact, albeit we don't yet know what that will be. We've still got the issue over labour shortages, you know, that Liam is particularly looking to find solutions for. All of that means that things keep changing. So the answer really, I think, is about being very close to your suppliers, making sure you've got your relationship managers that can talk to contractors, get information and then feed that back to clients so that you're trying to balance off all of these demands to make sure that all stakeholders uh, do get value for money. A difficult task that's going to become harder, which is where, you know, all organisations need to make sure they've got the right people in place um, that can pull all of that stuff together. Yeah, and, and it's going to be a challenge and it, it's, it's the constant change that does it. Um, Mike, in terms of a, looking at what we do and others do, how adaptable are others to move forward? Are the schedule of rate generally in use here? Are we fine? Is it just a value issue in your view? Are the systems, the schedule of rate system able to cope in itself? Which I think Peter's implied quite clearly it would. Or do you think there's a fundamental change in accepting that you are a systems guy with a systems a solution to this? Is it a major structural issue or is it fine? I think Peter's the expert and <clears throat> he's made the point a couple of times that, you know, the schedule of rate structures work and they work because 
they're applicable and the things that affect cost can be split out and separately identified and things like that. I think if you, you know, we've, we've built systems over the years to make the estimating process faster, but still leverage that same structure. So the point, if it, if it's about accuracy of estimate, and speed of approval, which I would suggest that that's where the admin goes is in that, okay, somebody's attended site, whoever that is, whether they're independent or whether it's a contractor themselves has attended site and done an estimate. How confident can I be that, that it's right? And if I'm confident, more confident that it's right, then I can approve it faster and they can get on with the work faster. I think <clears throat> that's where we focus our energy is, is making sure that people can, can be accurate and then that the approval processes are quicker, but when then where claims require additional analysis, the details, the details there to support it. So I think the details are necessary. Um, that's my personal view. Uh, but I think that way that it's built up and the way that it's created can be, can be speeded up as well. I think from, from the smaller value claims, just touching on a point a moment ago, smaller value claims, cash is not always the answer. Of course, we all know that and customers need to have the choice I think that we should, as an industry, and I consider myself part of the industry, although I'm kind of on the outside of it, um, think about how we can service those things through different supply chain solutions and, and, and faster processes. And, and those things are, again, all, all physically possible, but I, it, it takes a will for, for, the organ, for the industry to make that happen. And I can't resist but make a point on the single scheduler rates um, question earlier i think the idea that a single schedule of rates is the answer is you know from my perspective and this may be a surprise a few of you is it's not the answer but what a standard method of measurement would do could create a significant value again consistent estimating people are using the same line items to create their cost estimates and therefore get approvals faster because everybody knows what they're talking about. The commercial side of it and pricing, I still believe has to sit with the insurers. They need to have procurement strategies that support their ability to leverage their market scale. And those things can happen together. So I, th I think the answer could be that it is possible. Um, it, the, and the commercial side of it don't ne doesn't necessarily go hand in hand with the ability to actually estimate consistently using a single line, set of line items. So we could do both, but again, um, we've, you know, it takes time and you've got to win each battle at, a, at one, at, one at a time. You can't just all of a sudden say, this is the new way it's going to, and it's going to work. And we'd have to work. There'd have to be some kind of collaboration to make it happen. I think. Um, I think that's fair. And I think we can look at structure for a while, but I guess briefly, Liam, before I go back to Will for some closing remarks is, um, the bit that still comes back to me as I'm getting back to basic labour values here. So before the pandemic, we, we had the issue of um, competitivity and a shortage of labour, but we're still in tight pricing. We're now into a situation where we may have the same situation going on along with a, perhaps having to pay more for the labour and protect etc. So do you think the problem's more in structure or more in the values that we put into the schedule of rates? From a labour perspective, I think it's a balance, Alan, and I think the um, you know the environment at the moment, and all the things that we need to be doing are being restricted. Training people is going to be restricted. You know the stuff we've been doing with the uh, Apprentice Academy is going to be restricted because of the social distancing. Um, so to get uh, some kind of relaxation in the proximity of people would be really helpful. Uh, how soon that will happen, I don't know. Um, but the uh, balance between cost and efficiency. We've heard lots of gains from people working from home. Um, you know, it's been a real benefit to us. We've been kind of driven by a necessity. Um, it was a bit of a shock when, when we set out, but through the uh, the IT and the technology and all the video conferencing, I think there's been some definite gains and some savings there. I think anybody that has the uh, opportunity to do that, and as Will's alluded to, you know, that could be... Um, uh, changes to the business models moving forward. Um, all the stuff that Michael's talked about, efficiencies and scheduling and accuracy and the auditing, I think is great. I think there'll be savings there. Um, I think for us, it's about the boots on the ground, kind of getting guys into site to actually do the work. Uh, so this is your plasters, your painters, your joiners, 
I think uh, I think Michael needs to design something where we can have virtual trades that we can that we can allocate to jobs. That that would be a real benefit at, at the moment. But um, no, I think realistically it is just dealing with the situation. You know, we know um, the constraints that we're working to, working to, um, and we'll do our best. We're totally committed to to working with everybody to make that happen. Um, and we're just going to wait and see. You know, there's a lot of unknown, in, I think, in every building business at the moment. Um, you know, the, the kind of shockwave that's come through for the last three months. We're just beginning to um, kind of stabilise that now. And with the opportunity that we've got with all our clients, with all the work they're doing in the background, with all these uh, kind of savings, hopefully that will balance off into some um, commitment to the operational side of it, which is what, what we'll be doing. You know, keeping all your customers happy through the actions and the processes that we're doing and very frustrating. It's going to be very time consuming, but with that committed approach, I'm sure we'll all benefit. I agree. I agree. I'm, I'm interested in the uh, virtual trade. So I can <laughs> a session on the digital printer and a virtual trade coming out soon, but perhaps we're not quite ready for that one yet. Well, if, if you've got any, I'll let me know. <laughs> Just to finish up with you, I guess you, you, you quite rightly earlier on, um, address the issue of the survival of your suppliers and how important that was to you and, and some of the really good stuff that I think you, yourself, your business and, and some other insurers have done towards it. Is there any message you've got in relation to the pricing of jobs and the viability that, that you've got to say? Because again, you know, I'll go back and say you do have a bit bigger understanding than most people because of the breadth of your background. But do you actually have a, a good message to your suppliers that says, look, you know, if you're really struggling with prices of jobs, is it just keep talking to us and all your other insurers? Uh, don't hide because you're you're worried that you're going to look as if you're a bit uh, your viability is in question. In my experience, a supply chain won't hide if they think they're not being paid the right price. Um, so I don't I don't think that's going to change. I I don't really. I I think certainly suppliers that we're engaged with. Um, generally uh, really open with us and uh, and, and will we'll come and talk to us if there's difficulties or problems and, and I'd like to think they don't feel difficult or awkward in doing so and I think that's probably replicated across the market in the industry Alan. I think really the message for me would be more aimed at insurers because I mean the whole purpose of these calls is is because of the the difficulties in in, in operating in our in our market through through the COVID crisis and I think as things are starting to open up now, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm certainly no expert or scientist at all, but um, we don't have a cure or a vaccine. Um, and I'm relatively sceptical because we've been trying to find one for a cold for hundreds of years. So ultimately, my, my, my concern here is that I think, uh, particularly in the buildings, the buildings um, repair network supply chain, there are some really small, medium sized businesses that have just taken a complete hit um, of almost no income for a quarter. And I think that most will ride that out and survive it. But if we, if we, as we come out of lockdown, um, we get into uh, another, uh, we have another spike or another wave. Um, if that happens, I'm not sure some of them will survive uh, a second really severe lockdown. And I think we will start to see some, some disappear. And then once we get into the autumn and the, the furlough scheme ends and the tax, tax deferral scheme starts to hit in, in, um, I, I, I think, I think, I, there, there will be some issues. There will be some, some suppliers that we will, will be lost forever. So not really a message to the supply chain. I just think insurers need to, to the, as, a, as a market, as insurance companies, we need to make decisions really, really quickly um, to ensure the, the long-term survival of our supply chain, because if we don't, then some won't survive. Thanks, Will. I think that's uh, chilling, realistic, but I think it's also uh, very encouraging that we're, we're getting that message from some of the insurers that we've got. Hopefully that will go through. Thank you to all six of the panellists. Again, really interesting. It, it's very thought-provoking. I've seen that from some of the comments. Really enjoyed it. Next week, we're, we're actually going to look at the effect and impact of data in building claims. Can that help us with planning? Can that help us with claims? Can it help us with uh, customer service? It can help us control cost. Uh, quite an interesting thought as it begins to come available. And we touched on data again today. We will run the schedule of rates, pricing and stuff through right through the coming months into both the building and the home uh, conference because, you know, we've got to look to get it right for everybody as we go forward. And at the moment, it's not clear. That's no fault of the industry, but it's an opportunity to address it. I think 
Uh, reminder of a few things, building conference on the 29th of September, the home conference on the 11th of November, um, the fascinating um, Motor Claims Festival stroke conference online for three days in July, and of course the ARC360 motor webinar, which is every Wednesday at 1.30, I think it is. Please keep giving us your thoughts, your thoughts on the developing issues with building claims, how we're returning to work. We want to keep chatting about it. We want to keep exploring it. So if you've got ideas, uh, you'll find me at alan at iloveclaims.com. If you're looking at uh, any forms of sponsorship or anything, contact uh, Nick at nickisleofclaims.com or myself. Um, look at the news stories in ILC News. Again, contact if you're not getting the ILC News. We'll get that for you. Thank you so much for listening. And again, as with every week, uh, remember the rules. They're still broadly the same, I think, uh, this week. Hey, look after yourselves, look after your businesses and look after your families. And I look forward to uh, talking with you again next week. Thanks very much indeed.